Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Jenny Mon. I'm the Director of Clinical and Sexual Health here at the National Coalition of SD Directors. We have convened you here today uh, with an emergency meeting to really get some information, to exchange information, to gather information from the field uh, and make sure we can move forward together. Uh, to give some initial remarks, I'd like to turn it over to our Executive Director, David Harvey. David? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm David Harvey with NCSD. Thank you so much for joining us on uh, sh such short notice uh, for today's call. Um, I want to do a special thanks to Howard Brown for getting the word out through a press release. And I know that behind the scenes, a lot of folks have been working very hard to monitor on um, what uh, we've all been very worried about, which is an MPOX resurgence uh, this summer. We'll hear from our uh, colleagues uh, from the administration. I'm very grateful, Dimitri, that you could join us today. Um, thank you for all uh, for your ongoing work uh, related to MPOX. Um, so our goal today really is very simple. It's to take stock of what we do and what we don't know. This is very early uh, with some early information coming out of Chicago. So we will uh, take stock of uh, what we do and what we don't know. And there are some significant questions, um, which I am gonna just set out as a framework for uh, helping to facilitate the discussion later. The cases that uh, have currently appeared out of Chicago appear to be among uh, men who've been previously vaccinated, like some cases coming out of Europe. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, do we have a surveillance system that is adequately set up to collect information on current cases and their vaccination status? COVID relief money is going away. We were not able to secure MPOC supplemental funding last year, particularly for SDI clinics. If this is a resurgence of cases, uh, what does that mean for resources that STI clinics desperately need? Howard Brown has been very articulate about that. Um, our colleagues at CDC and elsewhere have been very appropriately focused on vaccine awareness. Uh, do we have an equal focus on testing and treatment? Equity issues are paramount, as everybody on this call knows. What are we going to do differently this time? to reach black and brown uh, gay men uh, 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 and their at-risk partners. Um, so thanks again to everybody joining us today. Uh, in addition to hearing uh, directly from our colleagues at Howard Brown and others, uh, Dimitri has graciously agreed to speak. And uh, we will also hear from our very own Elizabeth Finley, who with CDC support has done some really important focus group uh, research uh, with uh, communities and uh, we will post some resources there that may be of help to folks uh, around vaccine awareness and other matters. So Jenny, thank you very much. I'll throw it back to you. Thank you so much for that, David. And I wanna just flag that the agenda is in the chat box for everyone to see if you'd like to follow along with the call. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Patrick Gibbons, Medical Director at Howard Brown Health. Dr. Gibbons, thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, so, yeah, I would like to um, kind of talk a little bit about, you know, what we've been experiencing in Chicago. Um, so since April 17th, we've seen eight cases of MPOX. Um, of those cases, uh, six of them were fully vaccinated with the Genius vaccine, um, and one of them was partially vaccinated, uh, received one dose. Um, all vaccines were given between July 13th and November 15th. Um, for those that were fully vaccinated, um, three uh, were given uh, both dos uh, doses uh, subcutaneously, um, and three had a mixed um, uh, doses between subcutaneous and intradermal. Um, the one person who had partial vaccination was from out of state, and we actually were not able to figure out yet if that was um, subcutaneous um, or uh, intradermal. Um, two of the patients were living with HIV, uh, well-controlled with robust CD4 counts and uh, fully vaccinated. Um, the age group that we're seeing this amongst is 31 to 46 years of age. Um, and um, we're still kind of trying to um, uh, confirm SOGI data on these folks, um, but what we can tell from right now, all of them uh, were assigned um, the gender of male at birth and identified as having male sex partners. Um, 
all um, the cases are mild with the exception of one case um, that had some moderate proctitis. Um, and um, as far as identifying these cases, they didn't um, present any differently than what we were seeing over the summer. Um, they were presenting as you know what we've seen with mild cases um, with the typical lesions. Um, and then as far as the future goes, um, you know, we're, we're definitely concerned. You know, we, we have had another case today that um, a provider reached out to about that um, seems suspicious and very likely to be MPOX. Um, and of course we have um, IML on the horizon for May, on May 25th. And then we have Pride coming up, you know, in June 25th. So we are, you know, concerned that um, this might only gain steam going into, you know, the, the summer. Um, we have been reaching out to community and trying to um, kind of um, uh, spur interest in getting vaccinated again and, and certainly getting second doses in uh, for those that um, never came back. Um, but it, it's, it's been hard to get people in. Um, and we, we've definitely noticed, as I'm sure everyone across the country has noticed, it's, it's been really hard um, to um, get continued interest in vaccination at this point. Thank you so much for that. Um, some people are saying that your volume is low and asking if it's possible for you to speak up at all, um, but it could be oh. a, a, certainly a tech issue on the on Zoom's end. Um, can you speak to some of the vaccine hesitancy? Or is it the same sort of stuff that we were seeing a year ago or are there any sort of emerging um, concerns that you're hearing? Yeah, it, it seems like, um, you know, the up until now, you know, between fall and, and can people hear me better now? Is that Okay, great. Speak up a bit. Um, you know, what we've been seeing, you know, um, between, you know, the months in the fall through, to, you know, up, up until this current um, cluster of cases um, was hesitancy due to, hey, do I really want to go through the process knowing that it's really dropped off or that the numbers are very low? Um, so we're hearing a lot of that. The other thing that we're hearing is, you know, hey, my friends got it, or I know people in the community who have gotten it, and they have the intradermal, you know, um, the, with the intradermal, and they have the bad response, and I don't want something that's on me that's going to be swollen up and, and scratchy and itchy. Um, we hear a lot of that as well, um, you know, uh, in the exam room when we actually have people in front of us. Um, those seem to be the two reasons that we're given. Um, and I don't think a lot of a lot of folks, you know, what we're really trying to talk to a lot of people about is a lot of the visitors, you know, that are coming to our cities um, and, and uh, to the United States, you know, might not be vaccinated because they're, you know, coming from countries that don't have vaccine campaigns. Um, I don't think people realize that. I, I think people think like, hey, everybody's out there getting, full, you know, fully vaccinated. You know, these and these numbers are numbers in other countries are probably similar to what they are, you know, in the United States. Um, but you know, it's it's not the case. And and people, we're, we're trying to educate our population about, you know, hey, when you go to Mexico, you know, what I mean, there is no vaccination campaign there. You know, what what does that mean to you? You know what I mean? Um, so it's um, that that's. That's what we've been doing up till now and what we've been hearing. Thank you. Um, there's a question here in the chat. Um, are the epi links between or were they between these cases, either contacts or at the same events? Or is it the supposition that they were all acquired independently? So we, we, we were not able to get a lot of information from the folks that we did interview. So they were very reluctant. There was a lot of like, oh, this is a friend. I've got this. I will call them. You know, I will contact them myself. So we didn't, we found that um, the patients weren't very forthcoming with information and we were not able to have, actually establish any links. Um, but I would say that the majority of um, the folks that did come in, came in knowing that they were exposed as well. You know, they're like, hey, I've had an exposure. I also have like, you know, a very mild symptom. I think that might be it. And, and, um, and that, that seems to be the, the trend. Thank you. And can you tell me a little bit about sort of the clinical manifestation in folks who are vaccinated versus unvaccinated? There's a specific question here in the chat. Was the proctitis case in a vaccinated or unvaccinated patient? Great question. The, proctit the proctitis case was a vaccinated patient. You know what I mean? So we're, we're seeing a bit of a range. Um, 
you know, from, from the cases I've been made aware of, you know, they, they have presented very much like they presented in the past. The provider had a very high suspicion, you know, upon seeing the, the person. Um, none of these were cases where we, you know, the thought was that, hey, this is herpes or syphilis, and I'm just going to swap for MPOX just in case. It was, you know, everybody um, who, who had seen these cases really had a strong suspicion it was, it was MPOX. Thank you. And any travel associated with any of the cases? Um, one for sure, we have um, um, notification that they were in Mexico and their contact um, from their stay in Mexico told them um, as much. So they... Thank you. And any co-infections besides HIV? Yeah, we have uh, one co-infection with syphilis and one co-infection with chlamydia. Okay. And the cases that were fully vaccinated, they received the dose, um, do the second dose at or around four weeks, or was there sort of a larger gap? Do we know? Some of them had a larger gap, um, and some of them were given um, right around the four-week marker. So I'm just looking at my data really quickly here. We have um, two, three, three that were given like with a really within the tight range and the other ones were about more like two months, um, two to three months, so. Thank you. And what's your best guess about where this is going? Um, do you anticipate that other larger cities are gonna see something similar? Um, kind of what, you know, wh what, what are you preparing for in terms of the trajectory in Chicago? Um, what does that look like for you given the summer, the festival seasons, et cetera? Yeah, we're definitely concerned. Um, we are expecting more cases. You know, we we are expecting that other cities will see more cases as well. You know, based off of the amount of cases that we're seeing in fully vaccinated folks. You know what I mean? Um, I am concerned again. You know, IML draws an international crowd. You know what I mean? So I don't see that this losing momentum going into the summer. Um, so we are preparing, you know, to deal with a an influx of cases, you know, going into the summer. Thank you, Thank you so much. We are at time for this section. Um, I'm going to save these questions. I hope we can return to them at the end. Um, I do see some really rough questions, but for now, we're going to move on to Dr. Uh, Dimitri Deskalakis. Thanks. I've asked you to unmute. I'm sorry. It's a now it works. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Go. I I don't have a chat, so I can't I can't put a flag up for help. Sorry about that. Um, so thank you. So first of all, thank you, Patrick, um, for presenting those cases. And I see Dave Kern is also on. Thanks, Dave, for for both uh, city and and health and the uh, and uh, Howard Brown being so communicative. We've been in in constant radio contact, which I think is like one of the more important pieces of how to sort of handle things like this. Um, so first, thank you all for your work and the ongoing work that you have. So I think I think that I'll start by saying, um, you know, we we need to approach any infectious disease outbreak with great humility because it always throws you for a loop. So it's it's really important that we continue to do the work um, to both identify cases and get the word out. And I think this is something that David's already said, not only about vaccination, but also that we have testing resources that are a lot different than at the beginning of the outbreak. We have a high amount of, of capacity for testing. And that if someone um, who either has had infection previously or has been vaccinated before has a rash of concern or symptoms that they that they need to come in. I think that we are at the moment um, sort of living in a, a, a time when we're trying to gather data and learn what is happening in Chicago and beyond. I think that we are, you know, in uh, we're in close you know, communication with CDC from the White House about looking to see if there are other jurisdictions experiencing um, similar um, upticks in MPOC. So I think we're going to hear more. And thankfully, we have, what is it, 575 folks from around the country who may also be able to give us a sense of if they're seeing things um, on the ground right now. Um, I think really this is about, about, again, being humble. I think that what's been really important is that, and I think as Patrick said, um, we've been really signaling the risk of a resurgence um, using modeling and data. And so we, we have a couple of components that are so critical. One, we have modeling that says that this could happen. Um, two, 
We also have um, you know, really good materials and calls to action to try to get folks vaccinated as we approach summer and spring. And that is a really important collaborative effort that we really thank um, the folks who work in the sexual health environments to really allow us to sort of maintain this. We are in a different place than we were last year. There is supply of vaccine. And so that I think is really important. So the combination of we have vaccine and we have testing puts us in a significantly different place. We also need to have the, the, uh, the sort of uh, realization and humility that there is not just one tool in the prevention toolkit to prevent MPOX, but multiple tools that include testing, include vaccine, and also include the signaling to our population that they may need to change their sexual behaviors for some amount of time to stem the tide of transmission. So I think all of those things are on the table for us and really important as we move forward. And I think that again, um, Howard Brown is a leader in Chicago Department of Health in Illinois as a leader here has been so important. So I think we are really in that zone of making sure that we encourage folks to use all the tools in the toolkit and also to really continue to leverage the resources across um, US government funding streams to be able to do the work, whether it is an HIV funding stream from CDC, a Ryan White funding stream from HRSA, an STI funding stream um, from CDC. If there are uh, individuals who have SAMHSA colleagues, that they SAMHSA folks that work in mental health and harm reduction, they're also able to use their resources to get folks to vaccine. And then we also have a housing dynamic that still is important and is available to people to make sure that we're able to mobilize this. We're also in a different position and thanks to CDC and everyone, the crisis COAG funding has also gone out, which has which does provide additional resources to jurisdictions to be able to do this. I think that we are again listening and watching to see what happens with this. Again, like we do have jurisdictions outside of the US that have had upticks and they've gone in a couple of different directions. So we're gonna have to see where this goes. Um, that also means really close communication between jurisdictions and CDC. I think one of the things that I don't know if, C if someone from CDC is on who can speak to this that we are seeing is that there are some jurisdictions that are batch reporting their, uh, their cases. Um, it's really important that we get real-time information as much as possible so that we can um, on the federal level then move nimbly to respond. So um, if you are sort of in the universe of public health and can help encourage your uh, your epidemiologists uh, to make sure that the data does get entered in real time, especially now, it will be exquisitely helpful for us to be able to respond in a nimble fashion. Um, I think that there's a lot of science questions that we don't know. And I think we don't know um, how durable the vaccine protection is. We also don't know, um, we don't know how long it lasts. And we also don't um, have full data on vaccine effectiveness in general. I can say that down the pike, although we are we are going to be seeing releases of more VE data, and the, the view into that data is that it's about as we expect um, based on what has already been published. And that is important to remember, represents a range of, if you look at the VE data that's published on the CDC website, um, about 69% vaccine effectiveness for a two-dose vaccine, but the range is, at the, the, the confidence intervals go from 41% all the way to 81%. So I think we have to have a lot of humility and also remember that um, the vaccine does do a couple of other important things. It sounds like a COVID discussion, but it's good that we practice this because we need to continue to build that confidence in vaccine. This vaccine does seem uh, does appear to mitigate some symptoms of of uh, MPOX. It is notable, however, that it's systemic symptoms. It may not prevent the proctitis. So it's not, it, it's not strange to expect proctitis in someone who's been vaccinated. It also seems to prevent hospitalization, which is really important. So as we sort of go forward, we have, I think, the opportunity to think about festival seasons, to think about um, who our partners are, to see if we can extend the reach of a, a vaccination with a very clear eye toward equity. Um, I think we do have some opportunities. We we have been, um, based on a lot of feedback that we've gotten at the White House, really working with a lot of organizations that focus on, on mainly Black and Latino individuals, including house and ball communities, as well as um, organizations that represent some of the bigger pride events across the country that focus on Black, uh, gay, bisexual, other men who have sex with men and transgender folks. We're going to keep pushing. We've actually been pushing for the last two months on this, but we will continue to make sure that they have right the, the, the most up-to-date information and all the resources that they need to be able to be 
our sort of our, our links from the community into the work that you're doing to vaccinate folks. Jenny, I'm going to hand it back over to you. I'm, I'm happy to hang around here with, for questions and hear the rest. This has been really informative, but I want to make sure I don't take too much of your time. I also can't see the agenda, so I don't know how much time I was allocated uh, since I don't have the chat. So sorry about that. No, I'm sorry about that. We do have about six more minutes for you. Thank you so much, Dimitri. Um, what are thoughts on patients that test negative with suspicious, suspicious lesions? Excuse me. What is the suggested follow-up? Is this a question for me or for other clinicians? So I, I don't know if anyone from CDC wants to respond, um, but certainly I'm just, I'm going by what's in the chat. This is just information or questions that are coming in directly from um, folks who are participating. Is anyone from CDC able to answer a clinical question? Otherwise I'm happy to, to try my best here. Yeah, okay. So I, 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 I heard a voice, maybe not, that's okay. Um, so I think that, that, you know, I think, you know, if, if, if there's a suspicion for uh, MPOX, it's probably, and, and you have a negative test, it seems as if the negative predictive value of the test is fairly good. There are other sort of lesions that can look very similar. This speaks to our desire for ramping up a multiplex test. I'm going to say again, in like a big way, it's, it's way. helped us a lot to sort of uh, move that forward. I think we've been working really hard on that aspect, but definitely I think thinking about HSV one and two, thinking about BZB potentially, and also thinking about syphilis is reasonable. Um, so I think that um, if you do have a high level of suspicion, it's always not, it's not a bad idea to retest. I think the other part that we don't know is the effect of vaccine on um, on detection, um, if that does actually influence like the, the, the viral load that one would experience in lesions. So I think that if there's a high clinical suspicion, your clinical suspicion when you get through the Bayes theorem will still mean that you have a high clinical suspicion, even if you have a negative test. I see Leandra's on. Leandra, did I do okay? It looks like you have to unmute him because he can't unmute. Okay, I'm trying to. <laughs> Hang on just a second, Hello. here we go. Uh, Chris Braden from okay. CDC. Uh, I was able to get off mute and uh, yeah, not a lot to add other than the fact that um, early in the course of illness, um, we may get negative tests that are then positive a little later in the course. Uh, so to some degree, it can be expected early in the course that you may have a negative test. And, and I was going to say exactly what Chris said. I mean, you know, early on, this can be look like anything. So that's what's so important to make you know, making sure that we're testing not only for MPOX, but for, you know, uh, syphilis, you know, HSV, you know, and then like we do, right, you know, early on as clinicians, if we're not sure, we give a patient a, you know, short follow-up in two or three days and we reassess. Thank you for that. Um, another question for CDC here, uh, you know, is there any information on immunity that you're able to share? Um, immunity weighing against those who are fully vaccinated by either method. I mean, the messaging is this. If someone is fully vaccinated and they hear that there are cases and folks who are fully vaccinated, certainly there's some anxiety, right? And so the question that popped up in the chat was, should I get revaccinated? And so I just wondered, like, what is the thinking, um, you know, CDC and HHS, you know, is there thinking about a booster? Um, are there plans for that? Are there studies underway? Kind of what would the messaging be to folks who were fully vaccinated and are kind of nervous now that there are breakthrough infections? I just raised my hand to be unmuted so I won't mute myself again and go on mute. So I think I'll, I'll let Chris lead on that one. And I can be happy to follow up. Uh, thanks. So I think it might be helpful to go over some of the reasons why uh, we can see uh, cases in vaccinated persons. Um, and one is that the vaccine may be less effective than we have determined in studies so far. We've talked a little bit about that. We do have three VE studies coming out next week, um, which will add to the literature and add to the evidence basis for the effectiveness of, of vaccine. Number two is another one that we're talking about is immunity may wane over time. And we are trying to study that actively as we, uh, as we go on. It does take some time to determine if and by how much immunity wanes. Um, but we don't know uh, that it has waned at this point and we don't anticipate right now a change in recommendations. We're looking for the data to be able to make recommendations in that regard. 
the virus may change to overcome immunity. And, and uh, I've seen in the chat some questions about uh, sequencing, and certainly we would like to sequence as many viruses as possible uh, so that we can determine whether or not there are any changes that would um, induce uh, you know, uh, uh, immune evasion. Uh, specific vac vaccine doses or lots may be compromised. Um, so when we have a, cl a cluster of uh, people um, who had been vaccinated but now are infected, we want to look at that to see if there are common lots among them and so forth to determine whether that might be a, uh, an issue. Uh, also, especially with relatively few cases, we may observe random clustering of vaccinated persons among cases. So this is a, a, you know, the issue of chance observation. We, we see this often in epidemiology. So we need to be careful, especially around small numbers of cases about whether or not this is what we're observing um, and continue to monitor. And then vaccinated people may be among those in continuous care and more likely to be diagnosed and then be part of our surveillance of cases. Um, and so it may uh, be a surveillance artifact in that way. There are probably other reasons, um, but all of those may apply. And so we're going to be trying to go through those different reasons in our investigations. Sorry, I keep muting myself and raising my hand so I can unmute and not bother you. But I, I think the other thing to think about, I, I, it's a question for Patrick, actually, um, from Howard Brown. I find it it's pretty interesting that that almost all the cases are in vaccinated folks and that you're not detecting any cases in unvaccinated folks. Do you have an idea of like what of 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 why that may be from your perspective from on the ground? I think he's on mute too. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really compelling question, you know, why, why, why are we seeing it that way? I think one of the things that makes me really concerned and it might be related, um, and, and, um, that I actually forgot to include in, at the beginning was that, um, seven of the cases, you know, that, that have come to us have tested on the North side of Chicago. Um, only one case has tested in the South region. Um, where we have clinical sites as well. Um, and my concern is, is that, you know, the more vulnerable communities that are less resourced are not able to get in and test. Um, it's a pattern that we see. Um, and my concern is that we are not capturing cases amongst our most vulnerable patients. Um, it is our, and it's our more well-resourced patients that are, you know, the ones that are uh, presenting for testing. Um, so I, I feel like that might be part of it um, and why we're Thank seeing- Thank you. Dr. Gibbons, two more questions for you. What were the timelines of the cases and did the eight cases have prior MPOX infection? And then uh, timeline as in what, what was, could you uh, elaborate? Um, when were the cases identified? Were they in all in the past week or, in, you know? Oh, yeah. They've been identified um, from April uh, 17th and through uh, the last one was, I think, last Thursday, if I'm not mistaken. So. Thank you. Um, one more question for CDC. When will Genios order ordering transition away from health departments towards allowing for providers to directly order from the federal government? The latter method allows for more timely response to a resurgence. The current state is not nimble. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so we're, we're currently uh, working on a, um, a, a method to request TPOX um, that will also include uh, the uh, assessment of, of patients or the willingness of patients to participate in the STOMP trial. So we uh, really think that this, uh, for those who are eligible and willing uh, to participate in the STOMP trial is very important so that we can get some real data on the effectiveness of uh, ticoviramab uh, with this particular illness. Uh, that being said, if, they're, if they aren't eligible or are not willing to participate in a STOM trial, then uh, there will be a, uh, uh, a way to request the vaccine from the stockpile through the CDC expanded access IND protocol. Thank you. And one final question here. Um, can we get an update on national MPOX numbers? Are there other cities or states that are noticing resurgencies? Research 
So uh, I'm going to comment a little bit uh, to say that um, there were some questions about surveillance before, and and uh, each jurisdiction and state is a little bit different, and um, you know the the methods that they use to report to CDC, and some are faster, some are a little bit slower. Some states do batch uh, cases to some degree. That being said, what we've seen nationally and what is on our website is uh, you know a very slow decrease in the number of cases that we've seen over uh, the last couple of months. There was actually a time uh, on our website where the average daily number of cases was zero over a seven day period. Um, but we know that that wasn't actually the case because then subsequently cases were reported during that period of time. So we're working with jurisdictions to try and increase the speed and completeness of reported cases. It's a few cases still that are being reported each day but we are very concerned that we are going to see more of what Chicago has experienced. Um, and we also see uh, you know, some wastewater detections in, in, in a number of different jurisdictions that may be a harbinger of thing things to come. So we are very concerned, like I said, about the assessment of risk for the, for the near future. Um, and we want to be able to prevent outbreaks if we at all can. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Elizabeth Finley, who's going to give us an update on some communications tools and messaging um, that has been worked on in regards uh, to MPOX. Elizabeth? Thanks so much, Jenny. Uh, we've, we've been trading messages behind the scenes, and we're going to pivot just a little bit. Instead of taking my full amount of time on the agenda, I'm going to give you just a high-level overview and point you to some more resources um, so that we can keep this, this exchange of information going. We've got so many questions in the chat, and I know uh, folks want to keep talking. So uh, one thing that NCSD did um, last fall is worked with CDC to do some message testing um, of CDC messages to find out what people needed to know uh, to get vaccinated. Um, we did AI-driven message testing sessions with close to 280 people uh, to really dig into their vaccine decision-making. And we came up with some uh, top-line messages that folks need to hear. Uh, Right now is a really good time to over communicate. Um, folks want a lot of information. And I think with changes in what we're seeing and what people might be hearing about the virus, uh, there's a lot of space for bad information or misinformation to break in. And so even though we don't know all of the answers, uh, we have a lot of good information we can give to people. So um, one thing that we found last fall is that there are lots of people who still want the vaccine, uh, but have trouble accessing it. Um, ideally, uh, the efforts that are going on right now to increase vaccination efforts will help alleviate some of that. Um, they just need more information about it and they need those access points. Uh, one thing that we found pretty consistently through all five of our focus groups is that declining news coverage played a big role in people's perception of risk. Um, it is out of sight, out of mind. And so lots of folks were willing and eager to get vaccinated last fall um, or last summer when they saw this in the news and they saw it on social media. And they may not know it's still a concern. Um, and then one other thing that I will flag for you is that we in our focus groups found a high level of trust in you and your organizations. They wanted to hear what CDC said. They wanted to hear what their health department said. Um, I, I know that that is, is not what you may be expecting to hear after COVID, um, but really you are good, powerful communicators and people need to hear from you. Um, so to get to some of our top line messages, um, people told us over and over again that they need to hear that the vaccine is safe and effective. Uh, we we will need to continue to um, to learn more about what's happening with folks who are vaccinated already um, and and maybe experiencing MPOX, but to a lesser extent. And we'll need to uh, fine tune some messaging about that. But people had lots of questions about the safety and efficacy of the vaccine um, and needed to hear that it is safe and it is effective and. And as we're seeing now, folks can still be infected, uh, but just 
just not experienced the extent of symptoms that they might have before. Um, one, one particular fact that really resonated with people in message testing um, was the fact that CDC had included in some of their messages that unvaccinated people had 14 times the risk of being infected uh, than those were who were vaccinated. Um, one thing that we found that uh, also resonated with people is that MPOX isn't over. Um, they were very surprised to hear that cases could go back up again. Um, and so I think this is probably a good a good moment to continue to remind them of that, uh, that cases could continue to rise and likely will continue to rise. Um, people needed to hear that, um, that being vaccinated before travel or events is important and completing the vaccine series before, you know, they, they go through with their summer plans. Uh, there are lots of events coming up. Lots of people will travel during the summer. It is a good time to get vaccinated. Um, and again, um, they're not hearing necessarily about MPOX in the news, so they need to hear more from you. Um, what I will do so that we'll make time for questions is I'll put a couple of resources in the chat. Uh, we have some previous uh, presentations that we've given, some slide decks that we can share with you now. Um, if there's an appetite for a longer session on messaging and message testing, we can do that. Um, we are, after we wrap up STD Engage, going to set the MPOX Command Center back up on our website and get that up to date again so that we can continue uh, to have a good home for information. We at NCSD are working on some messages and a messaging toolkit that you can use going into the summer that will really emphasize that MPOX is still a thing and that the vaccine is safe and effective. So we'll make sure that you have those tools um, and we'll have a sign up for you to uh, sign up to get updates from us on MPOX. So if we have future sessions like this, you'll be the first to know. If we have resources available, you'll be the first to get them. Um, and with that very brief update on messaging, I'm going to turn it back uh, to Jenny and the rest of you so we can keep talking about the, the science and the clinical stuff. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was really helpful. Um, I do want to call on Patrick Stonehouse from Chicago, who's putting some really robust information in the chat. Patrick, if you're available to unmute, I've asked you to unmute uh, formally on Zoom. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, you may very well hear some cartoons in the background. I'm home with a sick daughter right now. Um, yeah, so just wanted to articulate that you know, that we are seeing cases beyond those that are that have been identified by Howard Brown. And, and thank you very much to, to Dr. Gibbons and Howard Brown for bringing all this up. Um, and there are other uh, other clinical partners that are report, reporting and ongoing investigations and contact tracing and case investigations with the cases, uh, the individuals who have been identified. Uh, I think right now we're at something like it, is, it changes every day, and it's largely due to the, the reporting issues that have been discussed here a couple of different times. It was, yeah, we were at six, and then we we're at 12, and then we we're at 17, and then we're maybe at 16. It is it is at times difficult to gather the accurate and confirmed information from all the different parties involved in reporting at the jurisdictional level. Um, but it is something that, you know, thankfully, we've maintained ongoing connections with clinical providers, community-based organizations, and community members from the very beginning of the MPOX response, so that the information that we're gathering is going out as quickly as we can get it, uh, and that it's going directly to, it is going to community-based organizations, clinical partners, but is also going directly to members of the communities that are most burdened and impacted by MPOX, as well as other areas of public health concern. So, we're able to to have direct communications. Just thinking about international Mr. Leather coming up in the near future, like we've had really solid relationships over the last years with like individuals who are into leather themselves. And so we just talk directly to them about what kind of messaging do you want to put out to others whom you will see at IML in a couple of weeks. What what would be the phrasing you would use for that communication? Not that you know somebody from the health department would use, but like the peer-to-peer -peer communication of this information. Uh, and it's been really uh, powerful just as a process for getting information out, um, as well as getting information back in about what is working, what is not working, what barriers people are experiencing. Uh, and so, you know, trying to do as much as we can to have this be a, a blip of sorts, um, rather than the initial ramping up of you know, the level of cases that we saw last year, but also not being 
you know, we, we can't rest on hoping that that would happen. Our job is to get the information, all of the information out as much as possible uh, to all of our community partners, our clinical partners, uh, and other jurisdictions. We've, we've also been communicating with you know, neighboring states and other non-neighboring jurisdictions, like, hey, if you know folks who are coming to IML in a couple of weeks, make sure this information gets to them so that they can be appropriately prepared. And, you know, if they aren't, when they get here, let them know that they can call the HIV STI resource hub and talk to someone there who can connect them to local resources. And here's more information. We're just really trying to get this information to into as many ears and eyes as possible. Um, yeah, just wanted to, to throw out that there's there's a lot going on in this space to try and respond quickly and effectively to what we're seeing right now. Thank you so much. And I guess a, a question for you, um, Patrick, and others as well is, how are you prioritizing that capacity? You know, knowing we have limited resources, we're kind of going back into a busy time of year in general. You know, what does that look like? Are you prioritizing testing? Are you prioritizing treatment, um, sort of, you know, field testing? Like, what does this look like? How are you sort of mapping this out uh, to anticipate sort of how to respond in the next coming months? I think you've remuted yourself one moment. I'm gonna ask you, let me see. That's the problem with this. Hang on just a second. Sorry about that. There you go. That should work. Yes, it did. Sorry <laughs> about that. It's automatic. No, no, you're good. Mute myself. It does automatically. It does. Um, so for us, we're trying to push uh, as the, the fundamental element of it for us is the connection direct communication on an individual level of what is the thing that this person is it willing and capable of taking care of, of doing uh, to protect themselves and others. So if the individual is interested in screening, great, we do that. If it's vaccination, great, we do that. If neither of those is something that they're interested, have the conversation with them about what they can do to reduce the, the chance of transmission or acquisition. Um, and relying on a lot of the communications that we've done, you know, for decades now in terms of harm reduction related to sexual activities and a lot of the communications that we put out last year that were put out, not just by us, but by a bunch of different folks related to how to reduce the risk that a lot of people uh, took to heart and acted upon that we saw dramatic reductions or changes in behavior from what folks wanted to be doing to what they decided that they would be doing in the face of MPOX outbreaks and reminding ourselves that the, we did this before and it worked. So now we have that, which did work, plus we have vaccines. So these two things together are really going to be an effective collaboration of protection within our communities and our jurisdiction. Um, and so it is like we have we do have resources. We have uh, a lot of I think we're in a very fortunate position in the jurisdiction that we have a bunch of uh, community and clinical partners that are charged with syndemic infectious disease work, not just HIV or STI, but HIV, STI, viral hepatitis, tuberculosis, and MPOX. So really leveraging those existing collaborations within the systems across different programs to get information out and provide activities and working with our uh, delegate agencies. And, and our, again, our community partners, I think, are key because there is no contract for a community member. It's just this is the experience. And let's leverage that expertise that you have as a person who is living this and, and let us provide you with the level of support that we can. And sometimes that is financial, sometimes it's other resources, uh, but really trying to be as creative as possible and putting resources behind communication and activities that are designed by members of the communities that we're prioritizing uh, as something that they, they feel would work for them. Well, all right, then that's, that's one of the things we're gonna push and try to support. Thank you so much. There are a lot of questions here about contact tracing. Patrick, this I guess goes for you as well. How are you approaching contact tracing for MPOX given the limited resources that you have and the limited capacity that you have? Does it differ at all from sort of other STIs and how you approach that? So, you know, we are still um, doing contact tracing for MPOX um, and we are um, mainly focused on, you know, reaching out to the folks, figuring out if they have contacts that they'd like us to help bring in um, and, and identifying those contacts. But um, especially with this recent um, cluster of cases, it, it seems that folks have really not been forthcoming, you know what I mean, about the contacts they'd rather, you know, notify themselves. And uh, a lot, not a lot of people are giving names, you know, they're, they're mostly um, giving being like it's a friend, you know what I mean? I got it, I can take care of it, you know what I mean? Um, that that kind of thing. Um, I, I know my network. Um, 
So it's um, we're, we're not we're not get, getting a whole lot of data there. Um, and like I said, we've not been able to actually interconnect to any of the, any of the cases yet. So on the the city side, I think we were actually talking about this earlier this morning. To date, we have I think we've had one person who effectively told us no, um, we don't want to do this at all. Um, and outside of that, has been pretty successful in developing connections with, between cases and contacts. Thank you. That's very helpful. There's another question here for CDC. Uh, will CDC increase the frequency of case reporting and other updates? It's currently every two weeks, which is not adequate to respond to a resurgence. Uh, thanks for the comment, and it's a good point. Um, you know, we were uh, on a trajectory to where we weren't seeing um, uh, clusters and only very few cases, and so we had uh, decreased the frequency of reporting, but obviously in the face of uh, the increasing cases or, or clusters um, will need to be more forthcoming and frequent with, with um, our surveillance. Thank you so much for that. There is another question for Chicago, and then um, we can keep going here. Has messaging been pushed um, out to Grindr? Sniffies, Adam for Adam, et cetera, about an increase in cases in Chicago specifically. Network-wide communications would be helpful. Any comments there? Uh, we we haven't specifically put anything out on uh, Grindr or the other apps about the increase in cases. Uh, but we have maintained a presence, uh, the remarkably successful presence, apparently like 10% click-through rate, which I don't even know what that means, but I'm told that's really, really good. Um, We've, we've had stuff related to our impacts response on Grindr for back, since, I think, since September. Uh, and it has been something that we've been looking to update. And then, you know, these, the the new increase in cases came along, which we were planning on doing some stuff anyway. So th this will be incorporated into that messaging, as well as, you know, one of the things I think we've been trying to get rolling, and granted, it's only been a couple of days, but it feels like it's been a lot longer that like there's been a ton and ton and ton of work on this. It's been about a week actually. Um, wanting to put like almost timestamps on our communications that are going out digital as well as print. Like as of this date, there have been this many cases over the last couple of weeks because I can very easily imagine folks looking at a thing and thinking, oh, that's what I saw last summer, whatever. Like, nope, this is about what's happening right now in our in our communities. Um, so working on the design, so we do something like that, that is, uh, it is conveying the urgency without going too far into it or across the line into like, uh, not, not wanting to do any kind of fear mongering or further traumatizing of individuals, but just making sure the information is out there and caught and understood uh, and giving the people the opportunity to, to act on it, knowing that it is something that is happening right now. Oh, I'm sorry, Dimitri, I unmuted you. I thought you were just going to roll. Go for oh, it. Oh, no, I was waiting to be called on. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so I think, and, and Chris can speak to this too, and, and sort of reflecting on what Patrick said, I think that we're uh, like on the federal side, really trying to flag parts of, of, of our, the web presence about there's something new that's going on. So folks are aware that that's happening. And so rather than sort of, you know, while, while we're getting, getting information, still you're going to see updates on some of the CDC website around like this very specific scenario and the sort of idea, the messaging of you, we have, may have to use all the tools in the toolkit to prevent MPOX, which includes vaccine, but isn't limited to vaccine mm -hmm. testing and behavior change are there as well. So that's already, and Chris, you may want to speak to that more than I will, but it's, we're, we're already moving that pretty quickly. Yeah, no, thanks, Dimitri. And um, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing, you know, quite a bit. I'm, I'm sure we could probably do some more and we're thinking about ways that we can, um, push out these messages at the federal level in collaboration with our state and local partners. Uh, so, um, you know, more to come on that, um, but I also wanted to address some of the surveillance uh, questions here and uh, about real-time reporting and so forth. And it's a matter of working with your lo local and state health departments as far as the reporting of cases. And we are in constant contact with the state health departments uh, through that pathway um, to try and, uh, you know, 
in increase the both the uh, timing and the completeness of reporting of cases. Uh, so work through your local and state uh, health departments for that reporting process. Is very helpful. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. I thought I was talking over someone. Um, there's another question in the chat. The median number of lesions in past outbreaks was 10. Is this less or more among the fully vaccinated? Um, I can say on average, you know, at, at Howard Brown, um, we, we've seen multiple people with just like, you know, two or three lesions. Um, um, in fact, I think we've had a couple with just one. Um, and then um, I, I don't think we've seen more than 10. Um, in this recent uh, cluster. Okay, thank you. Um, I do want to just, you know, I know we're kind of running that sort of at the end of time, um, but I do want to get a sense of, you know, what are the pressing needs in the field on the ground right now, you know, in terms of MPOX response? Going into the summer, what are the things that we could help you with? Any tools that need to be created? What are the gaps that exist? Certainly, Elizabeth alluded to some communications tools that are available. Um, what are the capacity gaps, right? What would what would be the top three eminent needs going into the summer now um, at the health department or sexual health clinic or CBO perspective? And feel free to raise your hand. I'm happy to unmute you. You can also put in information in the chat box. Um, we will likely uh, disseminate a survey in the next coming days, just a quick brief survey to um, get an understanding of, of current needs um, in the field. But what would be sort of the most important things? Uh, renewed media coverage. I'm seeing everyone's thumbs up in this. Renewed media coverage to drive demand for vaccine. Yep, absolutely. That's that's a that's a huge response. It's I'm, I'm seeing over 30 people <laughs> agreeing with that. I think we're on the same page there. Um, and certainly there's some questions about trying to find a fine balance between, hey, this is important, but we also don't want to cause alarm, right? That classic public health messaging, um, you know, you know, middle that's difficult to um, to to get to a lot of times. Um, is this call? helpful? Should we should we reissue this call and sort of maybe come up with the cadence that makes sense uh, in terms of every other week or something like that, just to exchange? And um, we're seeing a lot of yeses. Okay, great. We answered our own question. <laughs> um, just a place where we can exchange information, and, um, connect with our colleagues, and really just get the support that we need. Um, it's really difficult to find sort of a central place where we can come together um, and, and, and sort of get all of this together in, in one area. Um, FAQs about the vaccine is coming up as well um, and sort of vaccine efficacy there you know there probably will be some information there um, coming out shortly as well awesome i cannot keep up with the chat full disclosure it's going um pretty quickly here uh, we have a comment about addressing vaccine exhaustion from COVA, uh, from COVID and pox and how behavior changes, not about deprivation, but about sexual liberation can you be able to play as safe as possible um there is a question here about flexibility to use CDC funds to pay for food, events, entertainment to support community partners or to host vaccination um, events. I don't know, Dimitri or Chris, if anyone wants to respond to that. So I can start. I think that, um, and then Chris, you should you should follow in. So just from the perspective of of the, I can't really speak to food and and some of the other components. So maybe Leander will also his hand is up, so he could probably speak to that as well. But definitely the HIV STI resources, both the ones that are directly to health departments that are directly to CBOs, all of those uh, can actually be used to do this. So. Uh, so again, remembering that um, offering someone a MPOX vaccine or talking about MPOX education is also an opportunity for HIV STI prevention and, and, and discussion. So in the line of that work, it's all allowable. Same with the SAMHSA resources, as I said earlier. So if you're touching drug harm reduction or mental health, though they can't, the SAMHSA resources cannot be used to actually support vaccinators. It can support all of the navigation to vaccinators and other components around there. So, um, and I, I'm, I'm not going to speak for the crisis coag I bet Leandro may be speaking about that I bet that's what his hand is up for so I'll defer over to him um, on that but yeah thank you Dimitri you know I, I, I want to just you know mention that I think it's important to recognize that we are in a very different position you know that we were last year like, you know what I mean we know you know a, we have a sense right of the effectiveness of the vaccine we have vaccines available you know we have resources you know on the ground you know and, and the crisis coag were specifically designed 
you know, to really support all these kind of events, including, you know, the opportunity to 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 incentivize, you know, access to vaccination. I'm not, you know, 100% sure uh, where you can give food, but I know that small incentives are really, you know, appropriate, you know, within the scope of the credit squad, including, you know, media and campaigns. So, so there is, you know, those fundings are there with significant flexibility and how they can be used to really promote, you know, a, a vaccination, a among in, in individuals who can benefit from it. Wonderful, thank you so much. There's another sort of comment question here. Has there been any communication at the national level to states, uh, including uh, impacts in all the programs Dr. D mentioned, you know, STD funding, Ryan White, et cetera. We are still seeing challenges in that area. So I think it's really, you know, important and timely that you bring this up. So I'll just follow up. SAMHSA, we can, SAMHSA sent a fantastic email just a, a week and a half ago to all of their grantees that reminded people about the flexibilities. CDC, I was communicating with the center. There, there will also be a communication going out um, from the center um, per Dr. Merman. And then also, I think um, Ryan White, we actually not only did, was there a, an email communication, but we actually addressed all the Ryan White providers um, and um, at a meeting. We're planning on also doing a SAMHSA one as well. So the answer is yes, and we're gonna keep moving and have been doing this for over two months, um, but, but we'll continue to sort of magnify the message through those, those, um, those agencies. Thanks. Thank you so much. Being mindful of everyone's time, I want to turn it over to David Harvey and CSC Executive Director to close us out. David? Uh, thank you all very much. Thanks again for joining this call on such short notice. Dimitri, thank you for the uh, incredible leadership out of the White House. It is just this kind of leadership that we need uh, within our federal agencies, and particularly CDC, as it goes through its leadership transition. Dr. Mena, Leandro Mena from the SD program, really appreciate you being here and contributing to today's discussions uh, as well. A couple of major points which are obvious and everyone knows, taking stock of lessons learned from last summer and COVID need to rule the day. So uh, the ability of our federal partners to get out in front of this and, and, and get on top of messaging, I think is critically important uh, now. People are gonna react to news coming out of Howard Brown and other local jurisdictions. Um, and be fearful uh, or not understanding uh, the importance of vaccines, testing, and treatment. Uh, so defining those messages up front, some of which Elizabeth Finley uh, 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 reviewed for us, is going to be uh, just critically important um, as soon as possible. Um, we are all deeply appreciative of uh, your leadership, Dimitri, on these funding flexibilities, uh, which I now understand, you know, we're making more or less permanent. I think this is really important stuff. Not everyone understands all this policy wonkish stuff, uh, but this is such important developments that we need to do everything we can to support uh, going forward. And I don't have to tell anybody in this call uh, that um, while we have funding flexibility, there is not enough funding out there. The SDI system is a case in point here. There is no federal funding stream, dedicated federal funding stream for SDI clinics. Um, if this second resurgence, not second resurgence, if in fact we have a resurgence, then that's only going to raise these issues uh, once again for us to try to cope with uh, and deal with. Um, health department STI programs desperately need more resources. We have probably the highest STI rates in American history uh, with MPOX on top of it. Um, so funding flexibility is fabulous, but we need more funding and more of a focus on uh, the STI sector. With that, um, please know we will continue to convene uh, calls as needed. Um, one thing our community has proven uh, is that we're really fast at jumping into action um, and uh, we need everyone's leadership on this. So I'm grateful to you, Jenny uh, and Elizabeth and others for joining us today. Howard Brown, uh, folks, uh, Dr. Gibbons, thank you so much for conveying uh, your information. Patrick Stonehouse, thank you so much as well. Uh, we will be back in touch. We will be forming a listserv that you can voluntarily opt in on so that we can continue this conversation and exchange information. I say this a little bit cautiously because listservs can get out of control. So we want to use it for the most important late-breaking information. Um, our team will send you information about that uh, shortly. There'll be a lot of uh, other information sources for you as well. Um, and the existing ones are already in place that most of you know about. 
uh, within health departments and from CDC uh, and other federal agencies. So thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Good luck as we all go forward.